And the people stayed home and read books and listened and rested and exercised and they made art and they played games and learned new ways of being and were still and listened more deeply. Some meditated, many prayed, some danced, some met their shadows and dealt with it. And the finite people began to think infinitely and the people healed. And the absence of people living in ignorant, dangerous, mindless and heartless ways helped the earth to heal. And the earth did heal. And when the danger passed and the people joined together again, they grieved their losses and made new choices and better decisions and dreamed new images and new visions and created new ways to live and heal the earth fully as they had been healed. This is the way. You be the way. Because walking in the streets of the cities of man are you the builders of the new civilization, the seeds of which are upon us right now. So let us continue to outline the parameters of the game You Be The Way, an experiential companion series for the Urantia book called The Urantia Book for Dummies. What we learned from our last episode, the Cosmic Briefing 11a, is this. There are at least two kinds of games. One could be called finite, the other infinite. A finite game is played for the purpose of winning. An infinite game for the purpose of continuing the play. Finite players play within boundaries. Infinite players play with boundaries. Spatial boundaries are necessary for every finite game, but infinite games have no boundaries. Finite players avoid surprises and try to plan around them. Infinite players expect to be surprised and continue their play in pursuit of it. To be prepared against surprise is to be trained. To be prepared for surprise is to be educated. In this episode, we want to introduce you to a tool that we're using called Self as Instrument. We all have played the game of if your life was a movie, what kind of a movie would it be? 
What would you say? Yeah. Some would say, oh, an adventure movie. <laughs> Some would say it's a comedy. Some a disaster movie. On our way to work, we think it's a zombie apocalypse. <laughs> and when we get to work, it's one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Well, the Urantia book tells us that the movie of our life is a mystery. A real who done it and why. But much more like a virtual reality. But only if you take out the word virtual. Actual reality is the game. And you are the star of this movie. Again, in paper 110, adjusters are playing the sacred and superb game of the ages. And they are engaged in one of the supreme adventures of time in space. And how happy they are when your cooperation permits them to lend assistance in your short struggles of time as they continue to prosecute their larger tasks of eternity. Life often feels like a game. And usually, the winners are the ones who know how to play it. If life is a game, how do you play it? The answer will have a huge impact on your choices, your sense of satisfaction, how you actually achieve success in this life. James Karst, the director of religious studies at New York University, wrote a book called Finite and Infinite Games that explores the difference between approaching life as a game with an end or a game that goes on forever. According to Kars, playing to win isn't nearly as satisfying as playing to keep the game going. For starters, what do you do after you win a finite game? Kars argues that these players spend their time stuck in the past because, well, that's where their winning was. Infinite players, in contrast, look to the future because their goal is to keep the game going. They focus less on what happened and put more effort into figuring out what is the right move right now and what is possible. By playing a single, non-repeatable game, they are unconcerned with the maintenance and display of past status. They are more concerned with positioning themselves to deal effectively with whatever challenges come up. And in our world right now, we need a lot more infinite thinkers, infinite players, to play this infinite game within the finite. And so, how you play the game of life will define the learning that you pursue. Why? Well, according to Kars, to be prepared against surprise is to be trained. To be prepared for surprise is to be educated. If you play life as a finite game, you train for the rules and where the boundaries are. If life is instead an infinite game, you focus on being right educated, right learning to adapt to the unknowns that evolution brings to every door. Chorus writes, what will undo any boundary is the awareness that it is your vision and not what we are viewing that is limited. Whether you choose the finite or the infinite game will also determine how you define success and what you need to achieve it. Finite players play for power. Power gives them the best chance to win in each successive contest. Infinite players understand that it is endurance they will need to keep them going. Kars explains by saying, let us say that where the finite player plays to be powerful, the infinite player plays with strength. Ultimately, approaching life as a finite game or infinite game impacts your daily attitude. Kars asserts that for the finite player, life is serious. But to the infinite player, 
Life is joyous. The Orange Book uses the phrase, be of good cheer. Cheer up. Things look tough. But considering your life through this frame helps you determine if you are making the right choices to be successful at this kind of game that you really, really want to play. The finite or the infinite. That's what I like about game theory. It approaches the game of life from a first principle, that of evolution. (laughs) Evolution complicates things. And that's the game. Complexification leads to adaptation. And from adaptation, something new emerges. Something higher from something lower. Something better. Something bigger. And therefore, life is an omnipresent game of adaptation. It is a game, like any other game. The only difference is, is that life is the only game that we don't realize is a game. Each of us has made up, largely unconsciously, a set of rules based on our upbringing, our worldview, our cultural mores, our values, and our beliefs. And we think our rules are right and inherently true. But what we have learned from all these rules of living is that humans thrive best within a state of cooperation because it has always been the main strategy that has helped us survive and thrive after millions of years of adversity and struggle to compete against these difficult and varied forces of nature, like pandemics, like hurricanes, like storms, tornadoes, cyclones, everything that the universe can throw at the game we've dealt with. Game theory is the study of how and why people make decisions. Specifically, it's the study of models of conflict and cooperation between intelligent rational decision makers. It helps us to understand life and all its intricacies. In proposing the game, You Be The Way, we're suggesting a way of building a model which will bridge these two giant energy systems, the finite and the infinite, in the sense that there's a meeting point on the spectrum here a recognizable, almost tangible place on the continuum between the worlds of the finite and the infinite, between spirit and matter. And the Urantia book tells us that there is a gateway between the known and the unknown. And that bridge is your mind. The authors of paper 155 tell us that while the mind is not the seat of the spiritual nature, it is indeed the gateway there too. And so this is where we start. This is the primary researcher's method of investigating and gathering up the clues. This powerful tool is where we find what we are looking for, the proof that the spiritual experience is real. This tool is called Self as instrument. Self as instrument. This is where the spiritual gumshoe investigator acknowledges our personal investment and subjective participation in this research, serving as a kind of instrument in our own private collection and analysis of our own findings. This heuristic research method requires this quality, this self as instrument in order to authentically study the depth of inquiry into the inner life as opposed to my inner life. It is a necessary tool for any spiritual investigator's participation. The roots of heuristic research emphasize the fact that the spiritual researcher is not a detached observer and that he or she experiences the phenomenon he or she is studying as a first-hand witness. You are the only witness necessary to prove the case for the reality of spirit, and the value of the infinite spirit mindset as a winning strategy 
for winning the finite game that we're born into. The Urantia book tells us that perforce we must serve two masters, the material life in the flesh and the spiritual life of the soul. These findings that you gather up as we view the situation from different angles and play this game then serve as a trusted framework for interpretation of the reality of your own personal experience, what we call the rope, R-O-P-E, reality of your own personal experience. You become your own authority about what reality really is, what the spiritual experience really is, and your own personal connection to the universe. This then becomes your own private personal report for your eyes only. From your own open qualitative analysis of the information will emerge patterns and themes that for the most part correspond to the classification and the mapping of your own chosen worldview or perspective. Whatever it is, it's yours. And it can be the proof that the spiritual experience is a real thing and can be discovered and can be lived and can be expanded and can be grown. A very well-known family therapist, Virginia Satir, her entire work was done under the umbrella of becoming more fully human. She would write, to do this, one must adopt a mindset that goes something like this. Life is not what it's supposed to be. It is what it is. The way you cope with whatever shows up is what makes the difference in your life. And to cope with such a life on such a planet takes spiritual insight and infinite thinking to be successful in this finite game of the human experience. The Orange Papers tell us in paper 101, the germs of spiritual growth originate in the domain of your moral consciousness and they are revealed in the growth of your spiritual insight. Also on paper one, the infinite spirit, which indwells the mortal mind, carries in its very present the valid proof of its actual existence. But the concept of this divine personality can be grasped only by the spiritual insight of genuine personal spiritual experience. It continues... But material-minded man is naturally more familiar with the material manifestations of a physical nature than with the equally real and mighty operations of a spiritual nature, which are discerned only by the spiritual insight of the soul. The equally real and mighty operations of a spiritual nature. So how do we activate this spiritual nature and this spiritual insight. Well, the gumshoe handbook for spiritual investigators, which I will finish one day, states that in order to increase the accuracy of our observations, heuristic researchers must examine their own thoughts, feelings, and spiritual insights about the phenomenon as they experience it. We must observe ourselves as we play the game of life. We want to become the observer self without judgment. It's a form of responsible involvement on the part of any spiritual researcher as critical subjectivity, a kind of self as instrument involvement that is critical, self-aware, discriminating, and informed as any authentic spiritual investigator must be. Always remembering the second principle of spiritual gumshoe investigators, and that is, skepticism is the chastity of the intellect. More on skepticism later. 
Now, the simplest way we know to talk about the use of self as instrument is to link the concepts of self-awareness, your perceptions, choices, and actions to your results. These are the fundamental building blocks of our capacities to be effective agents of change. Hopefully, to make a better world and deal with these problems that are rising everywhere. And at the same time, develop our own potential for doing so to the fullest in the process. But not as extra duties, but as type of mindfulness as we pass by in our normal day-to-day -day activities, working to be the change we wish to see in the world, especially during these very difficult times. Our world needs infinite thinkers and infinite players to come forward and play the infinite game in this finite difficulty. The proof of the spirit within you consists wholly in the spiritual experience of rational and average human beings inside of us. And this is the only sense in which spirituality can ever be regarded as scientific or even psychological. Most scientific research into elements of the spiritual is often called pseudoscience, which is kind of fair. The term pseudoscience is considered pejorative and has become a little more than an inflammatory buzzword for quickly dismissing one's opponents in media sound bites because it suggests something is being presented as science inaccurately or even deceptively. And there's been a lot of that. Those who are practicing or advocating spiritual inquiry often dispute these characteristics and are working hard to investigate this. But there is a great deal of crazy stuff out there in the marketplace of ideas. And this is where skepticism becomes important. However, there's also something very important called truth. And that is the job of the gumshoe spiritual investigators, us detectives. There's a great deal of good work being done in our universities and research facilities looking for answers and trying to measure the immeasurable. And we want to join the ranks of dedicated heuristic researchers who want to know the truth for themselves about the finite and the infinite games. There's a long list of things that have made the jump from pseudoscience to established science. An obvious example is one that we used earlier in the earth being flat. Those advocating that the world was round were definitely peddlers of a kind of pseudoscience of its day. The same with bacteria and Pasteur. Later, they were all proven correct. A more recent example would be those who have claimed that the brain has the ability to adapt and talked of neuroplasticity. That was once considered silly, a pseudoscience. It's now clearly accepted as brain science and a well-established science like that. The example the Urantia book uses was continental drift, which today we call plate tectonics. The Urantia book authors tell us that spirit is a fact, a universal energy system fundamental to the existence of all things in the universe of universes. However, finite science has not caught up with that fact yet, and that is why we are working toward a science of spirituality. And where we are getting closer is with the body of knowledge called the science of psychology. And so we will be calling on some investigations into psychology. The proof of the spirit within you consists wholly in the spiritual experience. And this is the same truth for revelation. The proof that revelation is revelation is this same fact of the human spiritual experience. The fact that revelation does synthesize the divergent science of nature and the theology of religion into a consistent and logical universe philosophy, a worldview of coordinated and unbroken explanation of both science and religion, thus creating a harmony of mind and satisfaction of spirit, which answers in human experience those questions of the mortal mind which craves to know 
how the infinite works out its will and plans in matter with minds and on spirit and with us. The universe of universes is mind made and personality managed and the proof of that lies within the mind of each and every individual if they would only take the time to look inward. Here, one paragraph gives us three huge clues. It comes from Paper 16, Section 6. These scientific, moral, and spiritual insights, these cosmic responses, are innate in the cosmic mind, which endows all will creatures. The experience of living never fails to develop three cosmic intuitions. We've all experienced intuition before. They are foundational in the self-consciousness of reflective thinking. But it is sad to record that so few persons take delight in cultivating these qualities of courageous and independent thinking. It's this reflective thinking that brings forth the recognition of these three cosmic intuitions, which is the primary spiritual researcher's method that we're using here, that we call self as instrument. Now, this is both an instrument as used in science, like a microscope or a telescope to examine something, in this case, yourself, an instrument as our own personal measuring device for our investigation of the reality of your own personal experience, your rope, and self as instrument as in be the change you wish to see in the world, used as harmony maker, like a guitar or violin, bringing harmony to our own little part of the finite universe. Here, the Urantia book tells us that it is our motivation that is most important. And here, it is best summed up in this prayer from a man called Francis who lived in Assisi. This is the motivation for self as instrument. It goes like this. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, Let me so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, let me bring joy. This points to the critical importance of self-development in the journey towards personal excellence. You Be the Way, as an experiential companion to the Arantia book, is a way of moving forward into an element of personal excellence, bringing more excellence into our life and the lives of those who we love and the others that we come into contact with. Here, the spiritual investigator chooses to use their skills and abilities in deliberate and thoughtful ways to assist others who are in trouble in this troubled world. In short, they must use themselves as the instrument of change. This is the concept of self as instrument and as with any instrument, before one becomes a virtuoso, there is learning and practice and performance, as we outlined Cosmic Briefing 11a. This is the game. Here, we are referring to self as the self within the mind. This investigation explores the essence and meaning of the lived experience of those who identify as spiritual, but not religious, while living in a secular society, both inside and outside of institutional religion, and often among other individuals who also have experienced spiritual changes in their lives and want a better explanation than it's just God's will or God works in mysterious ways, which in a secular society 
is no answer at all. Here today, we have the same challenge in trying to open the doors of extraordinary perceptions, to peer into the greatest mysteries of the universe of universe, and to decipher the elements of the hidden dimensions of the triple helix of reality. The Urantia book tells us that we are 3D beings living in a 7D universe of universes. Here it tells us our code breaking is somewhat handicapped because we are looking at our three-dimensional landscapes with one-dimensional eyes. If we are to understand these higher dimensions of universe reality, we need to begin with the basic foundational levels of the threefold actuality of reality, the universe's DNA code of things, meanings, and values, and the ever-increasing levels of understanding that lead us up to the facts, ideas, and ideals, and even further, to understand what the energy systems of matter, mind, and spirit are, as we have discussed earlier in the series of the Urantia Book for Dummies. The Urantia Book tells us that mind is the technique whereby spirit realities become experiential to creature personalities, us. And in the last analysis, the unifying possibilities of every human mind, the ability to coordinate things, ideas, and values, is super material. In that same paper, it says, Though it is hardly possible for the mortal mind to comprehend the seven levels of relative cosmic reality, the human intellect should be able to grasp much of the meaning of three functional levels of finite reality our place in space and time. And they are matter, which they call organized energy. The second energy is mind, organized consciousness, which is not wholly subject to material gravity and which becomes truly liberated when modified by spirit. And the third is spirit, the highest personal reality. True spirit is not subject to physical gravity but eventually becomes the motivating influence of all evolving energy systems and personality dignity. The goal of existence of all personalities is spirit. Material manifestations are relative and the cosmic mind intervenes between these universal opposites. We're going to discuss the cosmic mind a little bit further on in the program here. In the next episodes of the Urantia Book for Dummies, we will continue the investigation into the consciousness circuits of the universe and the subtle landscape and open energy fields of the contemporary spiritual adventure, the cosmic frontier. The exploration of this frontier represents nothing less than a total transformation of our human understanding of the physics of consciousness, the ecology of spirit, and the full elaboration of the transcendental impulse bequeathed to humanity from the moment we cross the threshold between the animal kingdom and the upstepped circuits of the human mind and its outworking of consciousness, the creation and growth of the soul, and the wisdom of the spirit that lies within every human mind as the light that lights every person. This is the authentic spiritual quest for meaning and direction that is upon us today. And while it is yet to develop the discrimination of truth that it will require if it is to endure and flourish, its emergence is the necessary and healthy sign of a strong spiritual resurgence which has brought us to this moment in history, which in itself is of immense evolutionary proportion a shift in consciousness so fully epoch-making as to be even greater than the appearance of civilization or of the tool-making talents of our cultural arsenal. A turning point in the march of humanity, where the ground of presumed reality shifts, and the impossible happens as naturally as the changing of the seasons. So beginning in chapter 2, we use the metaphor of the tightrope walker as a maturing process, both for the individual and humanity as a whole. 
As we move forward on this narrow path towards our destiny, we are moving to another stage of our own life cycle as an individual. And at the social level, another stage of our civilizational development as the spiral of evolutionary development demonstrates that we've been using throughout the series. The Urantia book reminds us again, only a brave person is willing, honestly to admit, and fearlessly to face what a sincere and logical mind discovers. Paper 34 tells us this. Having started out on the way of life everlasting, having accepted the assignment and received your orders to advance, do not fear the dangers of human forgetfulness and mortal inconsistency. Do not be troubled with doubts of failure or by perplexing confusion. Do not falter and question your status and standing for in every dark hour, at every crossroad in the forward struggle, the spirit of truth will always speak, saying, This is the way. This is the way. You be the way. You be the way.
Peace.